All right, good afternoon. Um, I'm Sue Donarski. I'm a professor of economics education and public policy here at the University of Michigan. And I'm co-director of the Education Policy Initiative here at the Gerald R. Ford School of Public Policy. We are extremely fortunate to have with us today two economists who played a leading role in shaping policy for the Obama administration, uh, Professors Sandra Black and Betsy Stevenson. Uh, I'm going to tell you more about them in a, in a moment, but first let me tell you how the event today is going to be structured. I'm going to ask them questions to get them talking um, and have a conversation about their experiences. And we, we are hoping for an inside glimpse of how economic policy gets made. We want juicy anecdotes, <laughs> just, you know. Um, after we um, chat a while, we're going to open up to audience questions. There are cards in the audience that you can write your questions down on. And um, these folks down here are going to curate them and ask them of us. If you're watching online, um, uh, you can tweet your questions to at edpolicyford. That's one word, edpolicyford. Um, uh, and before I introduce these two, I also want to thank uh, the Charles H. and Susan Gessner Fund for their generous support of this event and for the Ford School faculty and staff um, for their assistance in organizing this, this event. So um, I'm going to introduce you both and then get you, get you chatting. Okay, so here we have Sandra Black, who holds the Audrey and Bernard Rappaport Centennial Chair in Economics and Public Affairs and is a professor of economics at the University of Texas at Austin. She's a research associate at the National Bureau of Economic Research, NBER, a research affiliate at IZA, something German, um, <laughs> and a non-resident senior fellow at the Brookings Institution. Sandra received her BA from UC Berkeley, PhD in Econ from Harvard. Um, since then, she's been an economist at the Federal Reserve Bank in New York, um, a, a professor at UCLA, um, and now professor at University of Texas. And she was on um, President Obama's Council of Economic Advisors um, for two years, from 2015 to 2017. <coughs> Betsy Stevenson um, is a professor of public policy here at the Ford School um, and the Department of Economics. She too is a research associate at NBER, a uh, fellow of the uh, IFO Institute for Economic Research in Munich, and board of directors of the American Law and Economics Association. Betsy earned a BA from Wellesley, PhD in Econ from Harvard, and she served as the chief economist at the US Department of Labor from 2010 to 2011, and two years as a member of the White House um, Council of Economic Advisors. All right, very distinguished. Um, uh, <laughs> um, uh, we also, you might notice, b besides all three of us being economists, there's something else we have in common that maybe you discerned, and we'll chat about that too. All right, so. Um, uh, we're all wearing, we're all wearing black. Betsy's a bit colorful, <laughs> I want to point out. All it's right, spring. So, yeah. <laughs> so first, let's just um, set some context about what role you guys played um, in, in um, the administration. So can you tell us the role that the CEA plays, Council of Economic Advisors plays, in the White House, how it's changed uh, over time in particular. Um, so either of you can, can, can start. Uh, okay, I'll go. I'll go. <laughs> um, so the Council of Economic Advisors um, is made up of three people. There are two members and a chair. Now, and then they have a staff. And the idea of the Council of Economic Advisors is to give advice to the president that represents what's best sort of in for the American people. So we represent the interests of the American people. You might think, well, everybody in government's representing the interests of the American people, but not exactly. There's a lot of different groups who represent you know, the interests of various different people. And CEA's goal is really to say, what are the overall pros? <laughs> what are the overall cons? And what will happen to the overall uh, you know, uh, well-being or welfare of American citizens and people who live in the United States if we pass some policy versus we don't. Now when the CEA started, these three people were equal and then they, they were all guys and they fought all the time about who was the best guy. So Congress said, okay, we can't have this anymore. It's getting outrageous. So they pass a new bill that, that says one of them gets to be chair so that they can actually spend their time doing their jobs instead of fighting over which one of them gets to be the head. So um, that, uh, uh, and then in, under Reagan, the CEA chair became a cabinet position. So CEA becomes a cabinet position, um, the chair is, on the ca is a cabinet member, and the two members are sort of like deputies or advisors to the chair, um, and the three together 
take all the information from the staff and advise the president. The way in which different CEA member chair, those pairings, how, the ways in which they've interacted with the president varies dramatically based on who the actual chair is. And it's not always a cabinet level position. So while Reagan made it a cabinet level position, Bush was like, ah, I don't really need this. Not surprisingly, Trump also, definitely I do not need this. He kicked the CEA right out of the cabinet. Uh, under Clinton, uh, CEA was uh, in the cabinet. So it's gone back and forth whether it's a cabinet level position. Um, uh, but regardless of whether it's a cabinet level position or not, it's always played a role in determining forecasts, economic forecasts, which feed into the president's budget. And it plays a role um, helping decide and lay out the kind of policies that are going to go into the president's budget. And then it plays a role uh, advising the president on all sorts of policies that might be considered. Yeah, so I, I would, that sounds exactly right. <laughs> um, so I, I would just, uh, add that one of the thing, one of the core functions that, that we do is to link the academic research, I think, and the policy. So we, because uh, many of us are academics who are serving on the council, we are kind of in the weeds in the research. And so one of our jobs is to take that research and make, put it into a form that policymakers and the president can, can understand and make sure that, that as they're d doing policy, the, that, that we're using the best evidence possible. That's, so one thing, that's a really important point, and I'm really glad you brought that up, because one of the things that I noticed was that there really isn't an equivalent for other social sciences. <laughs> And so there were times where I was like, they need to know the, liter the sociology literature on this right. or the psychology literature on this or um, you know, the literature from these other fields. And there was, we had real debates about whether it was okay for the CEA to write a memo to the president on the literature outside of economics because we thought like that needed to be informed. And there isn't anyone who's as close. So remember the CEA chair was a cabinet level position so there are these like behavioral units and things like that, but they're sort of many layers down. And, um, and, and, and so, you know, economics in that sense is quite elevated. Yeah. So to, to start out by making us feel happy about what we do, can you give an example where research actually played a role in steering policy? Uh-oh. I, I can. Yeah. <laughs> do you, you, go you go first. You can go first. <laughs> You can go first, then I'll take uh, uh, well, you can have my example if you pick it. <laughs> oh, so, oh, so I don't know. Um, so, uh, so one of the things that, uh, I'm not, you go first. I can okay, I, I, so um, uh, I, have, I have two great examples because one of them is where we moved forward because of what we knew from uh, academics and one of them is where we stopped <laughs> badness <laughs> because of what we learned from research. So. Um, uh, the, po the most positive one is what did we do going forward? Well, the president really wanted to see some movement on the minimum wage. Minimum wage has been stuck for some time and he wanted an increase in the minimum wage and there was you know, not a lot of cooperation with Congress. You guys probably know that because we still, we never, he never succeeded in getting an increase in the national um, minimum wage. But he, so, uh, one of the things President Obama did when he realized he was not going to have the cooperation of Congress anymore for the rest of his presidency was to think about what could he do without the cooperation of Congress. And he does have authority over federal government contracting. So he has authority to make changes to the way in which the government procures goods and services. But it's not unlimited. It, it's not like he can just say, I would like to do this. And uh, there's actually a procurement act that says he can make any changes to government procurement as long as it's in the best interests of the American people. Um, and so that it increases the economy and efficiency of our procurement process. Okay, so these words economy and efficiency ended up being really important to my time at CEA. <laughs> um, and, uh, and so I thought the place where just we had to lay, lean on research the hardest was deciding to raise the minimum wage for federal contractors. And we had to, as CEA, make a case. So, so one thing you have to know about President Obama, just in case you've gotten caught up in the current presidency, President Obama, he did not want to move forward on anything unless the lawyers told him it was like 100% legal. <laughs> um, this is like an unusual view, I know, in our current time. But he, he like, it, it had to be legal. 
And so the thing that CA had to do was convince the lawyers that, <coughs> that raising the minimum wage was something within his authority under the Procurement Act. So what did we have to do? We had to use research to show that raising, forcing contractors to raise wages could possibly give the government a better deal. So what did we do? We leaned on the efficiency wage literature. And we said, when you pay people more, there's evidence that they're more productive. OK, then the lawyers come back to me. Well, why wouldn't the contractors just do that themselves? They could always raise the wages. And I said, well, they're not thinking about the, po the externalities on the government workers. So as the federal government, we should be thinking about how the federal contractors affect the productivity of the people that they're working with, the, uh, the government workers. And if the, if the contractors are very inefficient, they're like low paid, inefficient workers, then that's going to have spillover effects on the productivity of the federal government workers. And if we take those spillover effects into account, we can make a case that forcing a minimum wage of 10 10 is going to lead to more economy and efficiency in contracting than not. And it really um, relied on, I mean, it was like a 20 page memo on all of the literature on minimum wages, efficiency. And then we did our own research. We actually looked around the country at places where uh, cities and states had passed like living wage ordinances, higher minimum wages, and we looked at what happened to procurement costs. We did a classic sort of diffs and diffs analysis, and we said, look, when these minimum wage increases have gone up, we have no evidence that procurement costs go up, and we see in some cases actually that procurement goes down, so we also had our own empirical analysis, and that uh, was in fact Passed. This affected a lot of workers. I mean, you hear federal contractors, you think that's small, but this is... Federal contractors are a large uh, body of workers because um, one of the things that has happened as we've decided to sort of try to sh shrink government is we haven't really shrunk government, but we've turned it into a lot of outside contracting jobs. So if you look in any government agency, a large share of those workers are contractors. I have I thought of an example. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, so, I, and it might be the example that you were gonna give uh, in terms of when something didn't happen. Uh, one of the things that was really interesting to me was seeing how research could inform. So my feeling is sometimes good policies might have unintended consequences and, and that might be okay, right? You might still wanna do the policy, but it's really important to know that, that these are the consequences. And so while I was there, um, they were talking about the ban the box policy. Uh, and, and which is a policy where it's, you don't ask about criminal history uh, right up front. You can ask later in the interview process to try to give kind of another chance to uh, people who have been involved in the criminal justice uh, system. Uh, and so I think kind of the idea of giving people a chance seems like a good one. Uh, while I was there, this really important new research came out. A number of papers came out saying that um, that there could be unintended consequences to this, this type of policy, which is that now because I can't observe that you have a criminal history, but I really care because I don't want to hire you, I'm going to choose other characteristics about you to, uh, to infer your criminal history. And that one of that uh, characteristic could be your race. And so what this re new research showed is that in areas where ban the box uh, uh, was implemented that you see that it, it had some of these unintended consequences of hurting uh, people who weren't involved in the criminal justice system but might be inferred to be uh, involved. And so uh, when that came out, it was, it was really important and part of CEA's job was to let people know and say, okay, you might still think this is a good policy, that's, you know, that's a, that's a normative statement, but uh, or it is having these consequences and you need to factor that in when you're making your decision. So this, I was just gonna yeah. say, yeah, so that's a great example of research stopping policy. And the other one I was thinking of was the college ratings, oh, which was it, yeah. it didn't quite stop the policy. <laughs> the president announced it. Explain, Actually, like, explain what it is. So college, happen. college ratings was a, a, a policy where what we were gonna do is go out and try to figure out the value added of each, of each college and then give colleges a rating saying like this, you get the most bang from your buck out of this college versus that college. And um, 
The you president have to get actually outside the White House were sort of screaming and waiting. So uh, every it's economist I knew do. outside hard to do. <laughs> was saying, "You can't really do this." It, the president announced that we were pursuing this policy my first week on the job, <laughs> and I was like, I got sent the the speech to read, and I was like, "Wait, we can't do this policy." And I call up everybody, and they're like, "No, that did, that, that that ship has sailed. It's like on the ocean. You got to <laughs> wave at that ship and just sign off on the speech." And I cried. I really cried because I was like, "I don't." We can't do this in a way that's not going to hurt really good schools and unfortunately help not so good schools. And then we spent the two years I was there just doing the research and showing how no matter how you did the ratings, we couldn't be fair. And that's because it you have to make, if you're looking at wages, you have to look somebody in the eye and be like, you know, you, that school, there's a lot of philosophy majors, and those are bad choices because those people come out and don't earn very much. So we're going to give that school a poor rating because of the types of majors that people are choosing in that school. So those theater programs, those religious programs, you know, those are the schools we're going to rate poorly. And I was like, I, I can't do that. Like, <laughs> it, it feels bad. And, and at one point, we're in this meeting with the president, and he's like, wait, it sounds like this doesn't work. And we're like, that, yeah, it doesn't work. That's what we've been saying for a long time. He's like, so why aren't we just stopping it? And we were like, okay, we'll just stop it then. <laughs> and that, that was the end of that. <laughs> but something did come out of it, the college scorecard, the data. Yes, yes, but then we got all the data out there. Okay. So the, the good, good triumphs over bad right. through research. Right, and so lost because of sleep. <laughs> <laughs> I think I remember a phone call on the first night. <laughs> Didn't know there were tears. But, uh, One right. thing that was really nice, just as a, an, an, as a you know, aside, the President Obama really cared about the evidence. Like, he was yeah. so interested in the research, and he was, he was uh, you know, he, he really paid attention, and probably my best, mom my best professional moment was when he called, uh, we were working on wages and why wages weren't growing, which is a big puzzle um, still. And uh, he called me and Jay Shamba, and who was the other member while I was there, and Jason Furman, our, our chair, was out of town. And he just wanted to talk to us about what was going to happen as technology advances and how that's going to affect wages. And it was the coolest 10 minutes of my life where <laughs> I was talking to him about skill bias change and what we know and what the research says and, and what we think that means going forward. And Dennis McDonough looked like he was about to fall asleep. He was like <laughs> trying to get us, because I think it was supposed to be like a two minute meeting and we were in there for 10 minutes. And it was just so cool because he really understood, he kind of got it and asked all the right questions. And it was just so cool to be talking to someone who has so much power, who really cares about what the research said. Well, that, that leads nicely into a question I was gonna ask, which is like how decisions around economic policy get made and how the CEA intersects with that. Because it sounds like it's not just something gets proposed and CEA evaluates it, but that you're sort of there at various moments in the process. So, so the way it, it works is uh, usually the Domestic Policy Council or the National Economic Council will, will propose a policy and it starts, um, CEA doesn't usually propose a policy, although it could happen. And uh, the lower level staff kind of get together and discuss, and so some of our, our staff economists might meet and do it and talk about it. It moves up one level to the, the senior economists, so they have kind of the next level up discusses kind of the bigger, bigger issues. And e at each level the pro of the process, usually there's someone from CEA sitting in on these meetings and participating and trying to give the economics perspective of it. And then it would be the, the, the deputies level, which would the, was the members, and then it would be the principals, which was the chair. And at each point, you kind of flag what the issues are. Um, and hopefully, you can all come to consensus. That doesn't always happen. But, um, but, but often, you know, people were pretty open to, to at least seeing your perspective and, and listening to what you were doing. And then once the principals had decided and discussed, then it goes to the president. So Every CEA is different, and every CEA chair is different. And the thing that was really amazing about working with Jason Furman, who was the CEA chair, was Jason had been with Obama since the campaign. So he had a really close relationship with Obama. He also is a person who just doesn't have a ton of ego, which is like a v not that common to find 
in anybody, but particularly like a guy with that much power in the White House. But what that meant was Jason's philosophy was we should split up our areas three ways. And Jason had the things he cared most about, <laughs> business taxes. Yeah like cared a lot about yeah. um and uh which was great <laughs> <laughs> and uh um and then he sort of delegated the rest of the stuff to um you know to the other two CEA members and we as CEA members got way more face time with the president than a a CEA member I think typically gets even at the beginning of the Obama administration so it can that was for two reasons, one is Jason's personality. The other thing was that um, the Obama, in the second term, he was worried that they were, he and his chief of staff, Dennis McDonough, became worried that it was too insular, that he was too hearing too much from just the person at the top. And so they tried to expand, like so that he was talking more directly with the people who sort of one layer down. So that meant that as CA members, we had a lot of access. And the way I would describe it is, Sandy describes the bottom-up process, but the bottom-up process is usually started with a top-down process. Yes. So the, um, for the issues that I was involved in, it would be like a meeting, and it might be me and the Treasury Secretary and the head of the NEC and the uh, head of the Domestic Policy Council and the head of OMB, and then we'd like discuss things from like a big picture perspective we should do something about hunger in the country. Yes, hunger, that's an issue, right? And so you, I'm being a little bit like uh, sarcastic there, obviously, but it was like you come up with sort of bit broad principled ideas. Uh, I'll give you a, a more direct one, like you know, Ryan has proposed that we think about opportunity grants, right? This was something that happened when I was there. So he wanted to reform the way in which we give money to low income people. And so then the sort of we got together and it was like, okay, should we do that? yeah, we should think about reforms in these ways, and then let's push this down to our staff, and then they're gonna work it back up to yeah. us and tell us like what is in the realm of like possible, what things would cost, what the trade-offs would be. So you sort of come up with ideas. Um, or so I give you another really clear example about that. We all get together and say, this is the top number for the president's budget. The budget number is going to be X. Now you guys gotta help us come up with all the policies that add up to X, which, you know, X is a big number, <laughs> um, but you have to start, you so that there's this yeah. top decision, then it gets pushed down, then the bottom comes back up and we make decisions again. And sometimes we go down, up, down, yeah. up, until it finally iterates to some sort of conclusion. So uh, lots of work to try to come up with the right, the right solution, the right recommendation. <clears throat> Can you give an example of a policy decision where the president's decision was different from your recommendation? either as an individual or as CEA? So we, we discussed this earlier and, and I said I had a lot of, I lost a lot. <laughs> Sandy, she didn't lose. <laughs> well, I, I wasn't there as long, I think. But. <laughs> um, so yes, um, and I think the, the you know, the, the thing was that even when we lost, the thing that was important to me was to know that that the views that we were putting forward as CEA were heard. And that was one of the things the president was amazing about, is that he clearly heard them. So one of, uh, economists, so economists have views that are more centrist, I think, than the rest of the United States, at least right now. So that means like in a democratic administration, the economists are sort of seen as being towards the right, le more conservative than the progressives that are you know, leading the charge on a bunch of issues. And that's because the economists are always talking about the cost, cost, cost. And I don't just mean like cost as in how much money it's gonna cost, but if we help these people, uh, will we accidentally hurt these other people in the process, the unintended consequences. And so we're, you know, Alan Kruger once said, the worst thing about being a uh, CEA chair is always being the skunk at the garden party. <laughs> and, um, and so that's the sort of, that's the role of the economists in partially in the Obama administration. And, and I, I think if you look in more conservative administrations, because again, economists tend to have more new views that are sort of more in the, in the middle, you'll often see them be having more the lefty views in a very, very conservative administration. But that meant one of the big policy debates we had was on how much to raise uh, overtime pay to. And I had a lot of, I have a lot of concerns about the idea of time and a half because of the fact that it, now I'm gonna sound like a wonky economist. It puts, there's a non-linearity, 
where you have to, at some point in the budget set, the person hits a certain number of hours and you have to pay them time and a half. Well, once you do that, what's the probability that the, you know, their, the, you know, what they can produce in that next hour is now 50%, worth 50% more than what they could have produced in the last hour. So what we tend to see in the data is that the more overtime there is, the more people just get restricted to 40 hours. Or if, if they want you to work sort of a regular, regular overtime is no problem because they just renegotiate your salary so it's the same, uh, regardless of whether you're required to pay overtime or not, right? So if you're required to pay time and a half and you work 50 hours, they do the math, and if you were making $40,000 a year, you're still gonna make $40,000 a year. It's just gonna look a little different. But uh, there was proposals to raise the overtime threshold so that anybody making under $65,000 a year would have to get time and a half. And that means that you're essentially an hourly employee. $65,000 is a lot of money. There are CEOs of nonprofits making less than $65,000 a year. And I had a lot of concerns about telling those people they're now gonna become hourly CEOs of nonprofits and that they're gonna have to figure out their nonprofit budget if they wanna work more than 40 hours a week. Um, and we, we had a meeting with the president. It went like an hour and a half where I presented my case and, um, and uh, the, the labor secretary presented his case, which was a much higher number. I was down at like 40, 42, 45,000 was, so we all wanted to raise the threshold, okay? We all wanted to raise it with how far we were gonna go. And um, you know, my, my favorite memory of the whole time of being in the administration is we're having this, this, it's two parts of this. One, right before I walk into the meeting, somebody pulls me aside and they say, Jack Lou is really worried because you're the most left-wing person in the, uh, on the president's economic team and you're representing us. So it was my job to represent it in the meeting. And I was like, you tell Jack I have his views. <laughs> <laughs> and so I go in and I'm making the case that it shouldn't be that high. And then at one point, uh, the labor secretary says, you know, Mr. President, we've been debating this and debating this. And I just want to say clearly, you know, what I believe is we have to put more money in the pockets of middle class people. And the president says, whoa. He's like, we're having a discussion here and I just want to put on the table. I don't want to speak for you, Betsy, but I'm pretty sure she's not over there saying, I hate middle class people and I don't want to put money in their back pockets. <laughs> Is that what you're saying, Betsy, that you'd hate middle class people? I'm like, no. He's like, aren't you saying that you think there won't be more money going into their back pockets? I'm like, yes. He's like, okay, now that we're all straight on that, let's get back to discussing the merits of this policy. And so he really got research. He really, really got it. And at the end, Jack, we lost though. At the end, it was the politics. It was that he felt like the progressive wing of the party was going to think he was too conservative if he went with a number as low as where CEA wanted. But he walked out of that meeting and he said, this is hard. I have really heard your really important economic concerns, that there's some guy out there right now who's working his tail off and he wants to be working a lot of hours because he's bringing home more money for his family a year because of that, and I'm gonna take that option away from him with increasing overtime. So he really got it. And he said, but there's this other thing, which is people don't see us doing anything for the middle class, and they need to see us doing something, and all my messaging folks over here are telling me this is the best policy, so I'm gonna go away and think about it for two days. So when we, we lost, Jack Lou said that I represented the case as well as he would have, <laughs> and, we felt like it was really, it, he made a decision that was based on the economics plus the politics, and he heard the economics. So we lost, but, you know, it was, it was well heard. The, the thing that I, that I really thought a lot about while I was in D.C. was the distinction between being an economist and what your politics are, because you can as an economist, we're perceived as being less progressive because we say that sometimes a good policy, something that seems like a good policy may have these unintended consequences or raising the overtime might not have the goal, you know, might not achieve the goal. When in reality, that's not politics, that's the evidence of, of what's going on. So I, I've, I found it really, I struggled with this because I would say my politics are definitely more progressive, but my research is my research and that's, I keep that distinct. And so showing that something like the ban the box policy could have these unintended consequences doesn't mean that 
I don't want to, I don't think that helping, uh, uh, reforming the criminal justice system is important. I think it's incredibly important. I think that when you make policy, you want to make the best policy that you can and know what the consequences are going to be. You might still decide to do it. Um, and like the overtime rule, like the evidence didn't suggest that it was actually going to help as much as people thought it was going to help. And that's important to know when you're making the policy. So, so I, 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 I realized while I was there that they're very distinct. My, my research and my politics are very distinct. And in, in DC, it's very hard to keep that keep that distinction clear. So I think that's a, a really good point, because when I said that economists' views are more bounded, what are they bounded by? Facts <laughs> and the research, right? So, I mean, we have, we have pretty unilateral views on trade. That's because they're bounded by the facts, Peter Navarro being the only economist in the entire universe who has a different set of views. Um, but it, they're, they're bounded, and we don't, yeah, they're bounded by facts. So it doesn't mean that I, you don't care and you're not trying to help. Right. right? So if you, if you think about your politics as how much do you believe in redistribution or how much do you want to like, help others, then we're just as progressive right. or conservative as anybody else, but we're just bounded. Right. Like we will say that trade has overall net gains, but that some people are going to be hurt by it. And so how much you weigh the fact that some people are going to be hurt by it is is, Your is, politics. is the politics, the fact that it actually happens is, is the research. And so to me, it was something that was really kind of important to think about that distinction because it is, you know, my politics and the research don't always line up, but, you know, because something that sounds like a good idea to me and helping a group of people that I want, it's really important if you realize that it's not actually going to do that. And then you think, okay, well, then what? You know, does that mean that I don't want to help these people anymore? No, it means that I need to know the evidence to make a good decision. So I'm going to um, circle back to the, the thing we have in common. So we're all economists, um, and we're all women. And this overlap of these two groups is not very large. Uh, and um, some of the things you've been talking about really get me thinking about gender dynamics. You know, who's arguing, and how are they arguing? and um, uh, large rooms of people jockeying for position. What are gender dynamics like when you are working on these issues, um, whether in the White House or with agencies or Congress? I mean, so the White House made me angry about my profession because I was like, oh, wait, it's not always got, it's trying to shut me down and trying to silence me. <laughs> like, I mean, the, the aggression towards women we see as economists in our profession, that's not flying in the rest of the world, it turns out. And when you go into the White House, you see like there's like manners and social norms and things that mean that men and women work together nicely. So it's not all sunshine and roses, but I found it much better than anything I had experienced anywhere else. I don't know about you. No, I, I, I was telling Sue yesterday that it was so interesting to me that when I went, when I was there, and especially when I was talking to the president, I never thought about the fact that I was a woman, that, it, that I was an economist, he was listening to me, and that was, I really felt like that's, that was my role and that was how I was viewed. And, and I felt that way generally, yeah, I thought the group of people we worked with were, were really a great group of people. Um, I, had, I was working with Jay Shambaugh, who was the member, as I, as I mentioned, and we had a really interesting dynamic because Jay is a talker, and he will admit that, you know, so I don't think he'll take offense, but he really liked to, to have, be part of the conversation. And I'm much more waiting and seeing and kind of waiting for my moment. And so he was super aware of that. And so we were, he would kind of wait for me to make my comment, and then he would kind of support my comment. You know, we usually talked about things before we went into meetings. And, and I really appreciated how kind of aware he was that our dynamics are really different. And, and you know, when I knew something was coming up that, that I wasn't going to want to talk to, I could always turn to him and, and he, would, he would take the lead. But he was also kind of watching me to make sure that if I wanted to take the lead, that he would let me do that. And I really, I really appreciated that. Were there any particular rules of thumb or, you know, um Customs that folks went by to try to make sure voices were heard around the table, and that 
there was not um, voices being quashed? So one thing would, is that there would be explicit um, requests to hear from, from someone's group. Yeah, to hear from a group, like, I haven't heard from you, what do you think? Um, I, uh, you know, the, if you, like, if there was somebody at the, like, if there was somebody in a meeting who hadn't spoken the whole meeting, we wouldn't end it without, like, getting them to weigh in. So there was an understanding that everybody needed to be um, heard. And, uh, you know, the, I think part of what really made a huge difference is just, it was really gender balanced. So when like 50% of the people around the room are women, when there's a good representation of you know, people of color, when there's a good representation of just difference, differences of all sorts of sexual orientation, parents, non-parents, you know, uh, socioeconomic status in terms of you know, your family background. And it was just, there was a lot of diversity and, and that meant that People, there was a different dynamic, like people were used to it. There wasn't a feeling of a dominant group. Um, there was a feeling of a diverse group. And I think people, you know, you're, you're forced to interact in a more inclusive way once you're in a really diverse group like that. And I, it was also really cool that everyone had a, a set of skills that was kind of, un to me it seemed like it was unique. So the, the economist kind of brought something to the table and you know each person kind of brought something different to the table and it was people listened to each other and and you did have to kind of weigh in so they would say oh we haven't heard from CEA and what does CEA think and so yeah yeah it it the other it it is a case that these different groups are really bringing something different so CEA is bringing you know the wonkery yeah. but then like <laughs> the nerd, the nerd what do the nerds think yes. <laughs> but but the, you know then there's these various councils you know and there's and everybody sort of assigned different roles you know the thing the na one thing people get really confused about is there's a national economic council and a council of economic advisors what what's going on with them okay so the council of economic advisors are people who know how to do economics. They're people who've studied economics. They're typically academics. The National Economic Council typically no economists. <laughs> and that's because they're not actually giving, ec they're not trying to develop economic advice. They're gonna run the process around making decisions on economic policy. So that means that they're gonna, they are in charge of making sure they know what CEA thinks and they brought CEA's views in, that they know what Treasury thinks, they know what Labor thinks, they know what, you know, they, they've gone to go across these various groups. And so, you know, it, it, it's set up in a way to make sure everybody gets heard. There was something that happened at the White House that was sort of before my time. It was in the first term, which was um, a lot of the women were like, okay, we're going to make sure no guys take our ideas. So they did this amplification thing um, where, you know, if a woman said something, another woman would try to say it again really quickly before some guy said it and tried to claim credit. But they were like... <laughs> That, so like the women were on top of this day one in the White House. They were like, okay, guys, this is Obama White House. We're not having any of this men stealing women's ideas stuff. So this is how we're going to do it. By the time I got there, like that, they didn't, you didn't even need to do that anymore. As you sort of said at the, at the, when you started those comments, this is not what it's like in economics in general. Um, <laughs> uh, there's not gender equity or equity of... Um, of ethnicity or race or socio any of that stuff. So the, the economic research is being that fed up and that you're tapping into in order to advise the president is not coming. So how, how does how do gender dynamics um, uh, in general, you know, econ economics not churning out many female economists, how does that affect um, uh, your ability to um, to advise the president about economic policy? Are the right questions being asked? Are there questions that are not being asked? Well. One point I make when I talk about the problem, the, the need to increase gender diversity and other forms of diversity in the economics profession, is that research shows that while men and male and female economists believe equally in sort of standard models of economics, right? We can all read the same 101 textbook and have the same sort of major, major, main ideas about how incentives shape behavior politics differ. And our differing politics mean that our policy recommendations that come out of having the exact same model about how incentives shape behavior 
we still end up making different sort of policy recommendations and becoming interested in different types of policy issues. And so we see that in the data, like women believe, female economists believe more in redistribution than male economists. It's not because female economists don't believe in efficiency, you know, uh, that the efficiency equity trade-offs. It's not that they don't think that when you tax people, you know, that there's no, in, no incentive effect. It's just that they think the costs worth oh, uh, with, you know, the benefits of, yeah. of redistribution outweigh any costs. So if, you ha if we have a field that's less diverse, there's two things that are going to happen. You're going to have a smaller pool of diverse people to feed into policy advice positions like ours. Um, and that was definitely the case. When I was leaving, I was looking hard to find a, a woman to replace me because I didn't want the whole economic team to be male. And that's because I think that do, women do bring different perspectives. Um, I, I also think that, um, that the pool of research we're drawing from is different because of who's actually doing the research. Not, because, not that they find different things, but that they choose different questions. And, uh, and so we only have the pool we're given. The more we can diversify that, the more you know, we'll, I think, have a, have a, we'll have done research that actually represents what the general public wants to know rather than a smaller sliver of the public. Should I turn to questions from, from the audience? You guys. Hello, can you hear me? Hi, my name is Sean Martin. I'm a second year at Econ in Ford. Um, we have several questions here about the role of other social sciences. So you mentioned that an alternative perspective from other so, uh, sciences, including sociology and psych, is lacking the White House. What can we do about that? Do you have thoughts? Um, I can have thoughts if you, you don't can, have thoughts. Yeah. <laughs> you can have thoughts. I guess <laughs> <laughs> I was the one who raised it. Um, you know, I, I think, well, there is a science and technology, um, there is a science advisory board, right? So when it comes, particularly for, pu no. <laughs> Not anymore, but. <laughs> when, okay. it came to, when it came to pure scientific research, so I should have been clear about this, there is like somebody who's in the morning meeting, like pure science. Like this guy taught me everything I know about climate change and terrified the shit of, out of me about um, <laughs> all sorts of stuff like antibiotic resistance. Oh my God. And like it was like a daily terror warning from the science guy. But. Um, but that, that continued on <laughs> when you left. <laughs> I mean, he was really good, but he's really scary. Um, so I was thinking more about social sciences and like the psychology, uh, psychology and, and sociology, um, and political sciences. Political so science. Represented or? Oh no, I just didn't know they had anything interesting to add. Oh, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> We're an interdisciplinary school here at Ford. I'm just kidding. Yeah, no, you're right. There's no I, political scientists. So you see some of them, I think, doing foreign policy advice, right? They have windows through foreign policy advice. Um, it, you know, I, I do think that getting advice from research is a really good idea. Um, and you do need, in order to do that, you need to have people who can interpret the research having a voice at the table. So I saw Econ having a big voice by being, you know, in the chief of staff's morning meeting with, you know, the president's top advisors, having the science advisor in that morning meeting, you just see more influence. And so the question is, should we, should the Council of Economic Advisors become a broader Council, I, I think that's one thing that could happen and, and could actually be quite useful, um, and uh, you know, so that it's a little bit more interdisciplinary. Or should there be some other kind of council? I think there's a, you know, there are, it's it's hard because you can only jam so many people into that room until you once again are in a situation where nobody has direct a direct line to the president because there's just too many too many people around. And one of the things that we tried to do is when we were working on a particular topic, we would try to bring in experts on the topic to, to talk about. So workplace scheduling, for example, was something that, that was an issue that we thought about. You know, should you have constant fixed schedules and, and how would that affect workers? And so in those cases, you could bring in the experts across disciplines and, and, talk, and have that conversation. Um, in terms of getting it to the president, it's, it's a little bit harder. 
uh, certainly with certain topics like education, there's a lot of different uh, evidence. And so, you know, we would put, you know, all the evidence together uh, or try to uh, when it was a particular topic. It is hard, as, as Betsy said, to get more more access to the president because it's a, it's a finite amount of time and so it's not clear what the best strategy is for, for that. Yeah, it turns out they only give presidents 24 hours in the day yeah. too. <laughs> right. Okay, um, my name is Hannah Zlotnick and I'm a first year MPP student. Um, so this question is, how do you deal with policy problems and issues when the evidence and research is mixed or inconclusive about what direction to take? So I think that's that's a really good question because that is often the case, right? Most of the research, you know, in some ways that's why it's exciting because we still don't know the answer. Um, and I view it as that's our job is to kind of say what is a good paper, what what research is more compelling, what what's less compelling, and, and why. You know, you know, our job is to be the expert and kind of to make the decisions on what we know and and also to be honest about what we don't know. But to some extent. You have, to, you have to make policy without having run the policy experiment before. And so you're taking kind of historical things that have happened and trying to infer what would happen if we made policy. Uh, it's nice when it's conclusive and you have the answer all set. That almost never happens. Um, uh, and so, so I, I view it as really that is part of our job is to be the one to say, OK, these are the studies we find the most compelling, and this is why. So I, that, I think, is completely right. I mean, that's exactly, sometimes there's like a lot of conflicting studies and right. we sort through it. Sometimes we have to lean back on theory. Yeah. So going back to Sandy's like ban the box example, in some sense, like you got really lucky in that these studies came out that, that had found exactly what we thought could happen, which was an increase in, in racial discrimination. When I was there, we were discussing whether or not to do it. And I didn't have any studies. I just had theory that told me this could happen. And the argument I had to make was, I was like, well, I'm anxious about moving forward on this when we have a bunch of states that have done it and we're gonna get some evidence and here's the potential negative consequence. What would you do if it turns out that that negative consequence is right? And should we wait until we have more evidence before we make the policy? But that was really hard because it was a not there yet. <laughs> it was a we're not there yet. But here's where my anxiety is coming from, and it's it was definitely harder to make that case um, than when you actually had some evidence in front of you. Uh, my name is Stephanie Owen. I'm a third year PhD student in economics and public policy. Um, so the Committee on the Status of Women in the Economics Profession, CSWEP, uh, they just published uh, their most recent newsletter, and it includes some pretty egregious accounts of sexual harassment and assaults within the field of academic economics. Um, you three have probably seen this. Um, so one proposal within this newsletter is to adopt a reporting platform like Callisto. Um, for women and others to uh, report experiences of sexual harassment. Um, do you think this is a good idea? And do you think it has any chance of being implemented? And if you have any other general thoughts or experiences on the topic of sexual harassment in economics? I should probably explain first what such a platform would look like. I don't know if you've read up I on it. Or read. I believe. I think this just came out today. <laughs> but it's, just yes. been, it's been discussed before. Okay. It's that there's, that, that there's some sort of central reporting platform where um, um, a person who's been harassed can register um, uh, uh, the incident and it sort of sits there unless another for the same, accusing the same person comes yeah. in. Um, and at some point it gets triggered that this information gets released. I believe, so uh, I believe this is the, the format of it. Let's pretend that's what it is. Respond. Hey, you can respond to this too. Oh, thanks. Yeah. I think you're, you're I already, open. I already yeah. did on Twitter. Yeah. I was cursing. Yeah, so yes. I mean, um, uh, well, you didn't respond to the policy, I don't think. Just your frustration with the situation. Right. Um, uh, I don't, uh, I have not read up on this particular policy. I know that we, um, it's, it's heartening to hear that it's better in the White House than it is um, in the economics department, so we just all have to aspire to better work in the at the White, White House. House. <laughs> 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 Let's get our tenses yeah, clear. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Burn number 
to. <laughs> um, uh, in fact, there's no females, are there? So no. nothing yeah. to worry about. Mm. Yeah. Uh, anyway. Oh. Oh, um, uh, uh, <laughs> so academic economics has a particular problem. It also appears that, you know, it, it's also a, a problem appears in, in financial economics or, or in, in um, uh, in the field of finance, in Silicon Valley, among, I mean, so there's a lot of places in econ that this is an issue. It's not just about uh, academe. Um, it Maybe the government is better than these other places. Um, I, um, we have a cultural shift that needs to take place, I'd say, and the only, one of the few ways you get cultures to shift is to sh change the people who are in the culture. So I do think that improving the pipeline um, and getting more women into economics um, is an important part of this. Um, uh, so uh, I think there's a limit to what you can do in terms of educating men about how they should behave. There's some, something to be done there, but at some point you hit a limit and it just has to be that you need to get um, more women in econ itself. Now this is a chicken egg problem. Right, so um, do you use quotas, for example? It's, uh, uh, you know, do you report bad behavior? Or do you affirmatively try to um, increase representation of women? Um, I clearly don't have a clear policy position on this. I'm just mad about the whole thing. <laughs> I, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so one of the one of the challenges is that. Um, we, there is a process in any given university for someone to report if it happens within their university. Um, the problem with any academic field is that a lot of this stuff is happening uh, across universities at conferences and there's still situations of power. Somebody who tells you that they're editing your journal article, they're the editor of the journal that you've just submitted your article to and you need to publish that article to get tenure, sees you at a conference and you know, perhaps is, is doing things they shouldn't do. Where, where's, what should we be doing? Um, so I was recently elected to the board of the American Economic Association. We have a board meeting in uh, next week. Um, you know, I, I, there are people have different views. And so I, I know about what we should do. You know, there are, um, you know, associations that take on a role of like an ombudsman so that if we see this happening, you know, there's a, there's a place that you can report that where they can decide. But as an organization, that's not the kind of thing AEA has done in the past. So there's a real question as to whether the AEA needs to step in and do something. Uh, if they do step in, what is it that they would do? How would they collect information? Who would they report to? Um, would it only be if you're, it's at an AEA conference or journal? Um, and so I think those are the kind of questions the association's gonna have to to wrestle with, because when we think about the, as a profession, what should we do? I mean, that's the only professional organization we have. Um, we don't have, we're not a collective in any other way. And I think every university has already taken the steps that the university really can take. Um, I think most universities have good, good process, policies in place. Um, so I think that's sort of the next place to go. Yeah, I think, I don't, I don't have the answer to how, to how to fix it. I do think the, the long run solution is if you have more women, these things will become much less common because you will be much less likely to be at a table with all men. Um, I'm sure I have certainly been at conferences where there are no women around and, and it is, you know, even if it's only one person, it's, it's really hard to be in that position where you feel like you're alone and no one is defending you or no one has your back. And so uh, I think kind of having more women around would make this a much better situation. And, and there's what, what men in the profession can do now. You know, there's, there's trying to shift policies and change the pipeline. There's what can people do as, as people who are in this profession. And I've had some um, male colleagues, classmates of mine, um, who've um, been tweeting back and forth about what they try to do to improve things. You know, So if you're a man who's been invited to be on a panel and you want to make sure there aren't more mannels, um, inquire about the composition of the panel and refuse to participate if, you, um, uh, if it's not going to have any women on it. You know, so use the power that you've got um, uh, to try to shift things a bit. They're all small things, but small things can add up. Right. Well, and they have to call out the bad behavior. You know, the you know one of the things that we heard a lot from men in the profession 
when the study came out that found there's this website, economics, job market rumors, the top 20 words used to describe women, um, only one of them could possibly be related to the economics profession. I think it was nonprofit. The other 19 I mostly cannot say in this room. And I have a, a potty mouth that you've already probably heard a little bit of, and I still <laughs> cannot say those words. So, um, it, so that, that comes out, and several male economists have said, that's just like three guys. And we're like, no, actually, like a lot of guys are going onto that website, and they're certainly not saying like, what are you saying? That's horrendous. Like, don't talk that way. Nobody's like, like the the lots of guys admit to going onto that site, and they're not embarrassed being on that site, even though they know that's how women are talked about. And when this whole thing came out in this hubbub, there were two things. One is I read an economist who posted on a public site with his name. What does she think men think about when they're talking to their female colleagues? And I was like, dude, no. I, like, <laughs> he was like, this is just male sexuality. And I'm like, no, no, it's not. But like, he thinks it's OK that he put that out there with his name. So that's a problem. What was his name? <laughs> <laughs> he put it out there with his name. <laughs> um, and then I. <laughs> <laughs> Um, the, the second, uh, yeah, so, so this is, then the second thing is a woman told me that she went to a conference not long after that and there was a group of guys sitting at the table next to her who were talking about how it was a bunch of ugly, oh those ugly girls that they let in econ, those ugly girls don't like it when they, you know, are talking like this and the whole problem is about the attractiveness of the women in economics and that is exactly what's going on on that EJMR, they're always talking about women's physical, physical attractiveness and then the idea is that we're only getting upset because we're not physically attractive enough. So. And that's happening in a setting and nobody's like jumping up and down and saying, you can't talk this way. None of the guys at that table, even if only one of them was saying those words, the other guys are just sitting there and you just can't, we can't tolerate it anymore. So it, she was actually tweeting that out as it was happening, Yeah. which meant that a lot of us could come out to at least support her, which I thought was useful. So yeah, yeah. it was a useful, um, uh, a good use of social media that she was basically <laughs> as these people were saying these things, um, she was transmitting it. And we're all like, get over there and take a picture. <laughs> Post the picture. We want to see who they are. So right. can I well, that's the thing. I think and it's the anonymity that is the problem, yeah. right? You can't, you're not held responsible for what you say. And so I suspect there'd be much less of it if they had to put their name on it. So, so the AEA, is, the new ethics statement does say you should not hide behind anonymity, whether it's in referee reports, which are also anonymous, or on a website, there's a certain way we expect everyone to be treated. Um, because I do think the anonymity is playing a role. Next question? How does or did a position like CA impact your academic career? Does the work that you completed there count as scholarship? Um, so, so it was really interesting be for me because when I was there, I got interested in a whole different area of research. So I, I, a lot of my research focuses on investing in children, and, and, and clearly that's something that policymakers care about. Uh, I learned a lot about macro policy and, uh, and wages and thought about what, what's driving wages. And, and so I think in some ways it's broadened my research so that I, I want to do more about, you know, I've talked to some of our macroeconomists at UT Austin about maybe working together, and uh, which they were very excited about to be trying to bring me over to the dark side. But, um, but, but I, think, I think it really, it gives you a lot more insight into what's, what the important questions are that as academics, I think sometimes you get, you get buried in the weeds. And, and when you're in DC, you really have to take that step back and say, okay, what are the big picture questions that people are thinking about? And how can I use economics and data to help inform, inform that? That's a really nice answer. Oh, thank you. Um, <laughs> it's, a, it's a nice answer because like, there's like the not nice short answer, which is you can't do research for two years. <laughs> You can't, and no, what you do there does not count as research. It doesn't matter how many papers yeah. you write there. <laughs> doesn't matter how many chapters you publish in the economic report of the president. You, you know, one of the things in government is we never put our name on anything, so that's one reason. Um, but it's, it's just, 
yeah, you're um, particularly at, at the level we were at. Yeah. We're, we're not. We neither have the time nor are we permitted to touch our own research. I had to resign from the National Bureau of Economic Research. You know, again, that was back in a day where there was a certain amount of ethics yeah. that were being imposed, and we were I, we were told resign from everything except the only thing you have an exception on is a tenured position. Yeah. But um, but it does broaden. It broadened me so much. And it helped me think about like what matters and what doesn't matter, and it, you know, it made me a better writer and better thinking about policy, and it made me want to come to a school where my knowledge about policy making would really be appreciated, and so it was one of the driving forces moving me here to Ford was that I could think about policy and research at the same time, and like both parts of me would be highly valued by the faculty. I mean, I would say that universities and departments differ in how much they value um, um, public engagement. And if you are somebody who cares about, if, if you're going to be an academic and you care about engaging um, um, with public policy and that's going to be part of what you do, you choose a department that values that because <laughs> otherwise you will not get credit for it. But um, uh, schools of public policy in particular tend to, tend to value this quite a bit. Um, so how do you think that the facts economists find through their own research can become more commonly known or part of popular discourse? Send them to Sue or she'll tweet about them. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of true, actually. I do think we need to be more, more inventive about, you know, so um, communicating well is not something that is taught in economics departments. You might have noticed that. Um, and there's also Present a, company accepted, ex of course. You, you, then there's selection <laughs> exactly. into economics. So there are some people who come in already having some communication <laughs> skills, and we hope they survive being trained, having that trained out of them. Um, but it's, it's, you know, I think, I think this is, um, uh, you need to learn to, I, I actually think that um, uh, the kind of training that we do here as, uh, to Masters of Public Policy is, is, is terrific in that regard, because we're all about translating. Um, expertise into a, a format where it can make a difference in politics. So um, speaking good English um, is, is important and not using um, in-tribe language. I think this is not just true for economics, but also for sociology and psychology. If you go out into a, a public setting and you're, you're um, um, speaking about the evidence around a given policy, but you're using tons of insider jargon, you're not going to get anywhere, right? You need to be able to speak in such a way that, that um, um, people who are not total nerds uh, can understand. So I think um, uh, people who play the role of translating facts into um, engaging um, um, sticky facts. There's a nice book out there called um, What Sticks? Is that what it's called? Do you know this book? Make it stick. Make it stick. Make it stick. So it's basically about stories. So, you know, charts and tables don't tend to grip people's minds. Stories and narratives and anecdotes tend to. So it becomes about, you know, if you're, you're going to get a fact out there, you need some sort of story that goes with it as well, something that, that makes the whole um, uh, statistic stick in somebody's mind. And we're not particularly well trained to do that, um, but those who <coughs> care about policy um, probably do need the training. So it's, you know, I think the professional associations can play some role in that, for example. So I, I completely agree with that. And it's not just about caring about policy. So I'm writing a Principles of Economics textbook. Anyone who's read it probably knows I care a lot about stories, because I think that stories communicate ideas. Um, and so you know, when um, you know, my development editor says, do you think it's too gross to describe a negative externality as farting in an elevator? I'm like, do you, do you think that anybody who reads that is ever going to forget what a negative externality <laughs> is? <laughs> Just like, that's a good point. <laughs> um, so, you know, you have to figure out how we communicate these things in a way that makes it stick. I, com I completely agree with this. And I've been having actually like an existential crisis about it with public, you know, some recent public policy decisions because, like, as I said, the, the economists have pretty uniform views on trade. And yet we seem to have failed to communicate to the public the sort of general facts about trade. And I'm thinking, 
You know, I wash my hands all the time because the doctors tell me that there are germs on them and if I wash my hands, I won't get sick as much. But I never see those germs and I never have any actual evidence that hand washing is keeping me healthy. But the doctors convinced me, <laughs> the health professionals, I never question it. And how do we get economics to be like hand washing so that our, the general principles of our field can be communicated so that we're not like so that the current the definition of the current account which is an identity becomes like a political debating point about the relationship between uh you know various parts of the current account so we have that to do better help. calling yeah. a current account doesn't help no i i nor to say comparative advantage right <laughs> so we you know that's we, this is a case so this is a case, an example of something that we, uh, economists agree on it so much that we don't talk about it and we don't spend much time convincing each other of it using words other than you just say comparative advantage and Conversation's done. I'm just okay. Back to our offices. Um, but that's not sufficient um, in the public, in the public arena, or oh, current account identity. Yeah. Room call silent. <laughs> right. uh, no, that that's fair. That's fair. That you, but it, we do have a bunch of facts, and we need to figure out how we're going to communicate the facts to the public that you know if. You know, what happens, what do we need to have happen in order for us to reduce the trade deficit with China, right? We need to buy less of their stuff, so we need to pay more for their stuff. And, you know, we need to send them more of our stuff so that they pay less for our stuff. And we also need to make sure that they're not buying our debt because, you know, we're passing a debt package where we need to get more people to loan us some money. Those are the things that will all have to happen. We need to make sure the public understands those are just facts, they're not opinions. But getting back, you know, um, valuing persuasive writing, um, uh, uh, I think is something that economists don't tend to do. You know, I've heard people say things like, well, you know, look, you should just be able, ideally, you should just be able to publish the, the, the tables and the figures and that's science. That's the science and that should convince people. Um, and everything else is sort of public relations or window dressing or somehow dishonest. And even like comments like, something that's well written makes me nervous. You know, I don't trust something that's too well written because it's sort of, you know, using these tricky, persuasive <laughs> methods to make me think things. And that just needs to be stamped out. Um, uh, but seriously, I mean, you know, the idea that having a narrative is window dressing, I think, needs to be stamped out. That you, you know, we need, if we actually want this stuff to have an impact beyond our classrooms, you need to actually be able to communicate it in a way that is persuasive. Research has shown that female co-authors get less credit if their contributions are ambiguous. Uh, publishing in economics is alphabetical um, in terms of order of authors. Uh, do you think changing this practice is something people are discussing? Um, do you think it could possibly or is it should something that should be changed? It's definitely something people are discussing. Um, you know, there's discussion about whether it should be randomized, actually. So that, that doesn't help in terms of the reducing ambiguity. <laughs> It just means, uh, but that's that's because the the people at the end of the alphabet that are sort of throwing a um, a fit. Oh, bitter. Yeah. <laughs> well, My last name's Black, so I'm good with the alphabetical <laughs> for the most part. <laughs> so there is this like research that the first author gets like excess credit, and so then there's this stuff about should we randomize it and. And my, one of my fears about randomizing it is like, okay, so randomly Sandy gets her name put as second author, are people gonna be more likely to think that it wasn't random because you're a woman when, it gets, when you get randomized to the back? So I, I think it's just like, we don't know what to do, but people are definitely talking about the fact that we need to think about what to do. I mean, we could, I guess, line it up by order of contribution, but it's actually not how economists work with each other. Right. I, I, I would find it, hard to work on a paper with someone and be like, I'm going to be the 30 percent and you're yeah. going to be the 70 <laughs> yeah, percent. <exactly. laughs> like economists basically are like, I'm going to be the 100 percent and you're going to be the 100 <laughs> exactly. percent. So the, the research that's being referred to showed that um, when it comes to tenure time, um, when um, women co-author with men, um, uh, men 
that, that counts towards men's tenure, and it tends not to count towards women's tenure. Just when you look at the probability of somebody getting tenure against their number of publications, if a woman co-authors with men, it tends to get undercounted, just if you look in the numbers, like who actually ends up in tenure. So I was at a conference recently where the author, Heather Sarsons, of this work was, was, was talking about it, and we asked, what do we do about it? What do we, how do we fix it? Um, uh, and um, her, um, uh, you know, sh tracing back where she think, thought she was coming from, it seemed in part it was uh, that women were less likely to be presenting the work at conferences and seminars. And that's where a lot of us start to attribute whose work it is. Uh, so you see somebody give the work and you decide it's their work. Um, so it came back to um, if you are somebody who organizes seminars, organizes conferences, to make sure that the female author is out there um, and presenting the work. It's at least uh, quantitatively, that's, that's at least part of the explanation that she came across. But it, it's also part of the fact that you ask, I just, I've seen this, I've witnessed it in many faculty meetings where when it's a woman and she has co-authors, they ask about, well, the co-authors are senior, more senior than her, should we be worried about this? And like somehow you see a guy in the exact same situation and they don't ask the question. So like I shout it down now just every time. Like, you know, people, our profession is full of people who write co-authored papers. I don't think we should be having that conversation because I do, I mean, that, that, it's that implicit bias. It's that it comes up when it's women and it doesn't come up when it's men. And I think part of the problem is that there are too few women in the room when they're having that tenure conversation, right? Because the number of tenured women is much lower, so. That's like my favorite thing is that, you know, there are guys who get tenure letters that say he's much better than his papers. No woman's ever gotten a tenure letter that says she's much better than her papers. It's usually she's much worse than her papers. <laughs> Uh, the example from Dr. Black about having to recommend a halt to the ban of the box because of research was very interesting. Do you have any other examples of when this happened? Gosh, I thought that was such a good one. <laughs> Do I need you, more you than You left them hungry for more. I know. Um, oh, I need to think. I, don't, I can't think of one. So I, I think public policy is, um, and, and engaging in public policy is, uh, as, a, as a researcher, um, as an advocate, is much more about stopping dumb things than promulgating smart things than people tend to think. So a lot of the b b biggest successes I can think of is stopping something really horrible from happening. So you get. But it, it's usually not something where there's like a ton of ambiguity and then the research right. helps you. It's sort right. of, it, it's just sort of helping like them see the problem. Sense. But <laughs> I, I'll give you an example that, so I, I said, you know, we use the research to justify raising the minimum wage for federal contractors to 1010. But there, the, the president had this weird relationship with the minimum wage, which was he decided, you know, sort of, uh, I don't know, in 2011 that he was going to support an, a re an increase in the minimum wage to like, was it 950, 925, do you remember? And he announced it in the State of the Union, and, and then the congressional Democrats were like, you are a weak progressive. We are going to 1010, buddy. And he's like, great, now I got a misalignment between me and the congressional Democrats. And then there was like lots and lots and lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of debate about whether he should come up to 1010. And we did tons of analysis and decided that 1010 was still really in the range, particularly because if you wait long enough, uh, inflation helps you so that these numbers get closer together because we're always talking about it in nominal terms. So you, you wait it out and then it's, it's a smaller number. Um, it's the DC trick. Yeah. <laughs> um, we'll keep but the level the same and we'll move it further back. For the, and then <laughs> inflation adjusted, it'll be different. So, um, so, so we look at it and we're like, well, it's still in the range where uh, there will be very, very small negative employment effects. So he comes, he supports 1010. And then, I don't know, like two more years pass. And now it's, or three, three more years pass, and now it's like 2015, and congressional Democrats have decided that they are done with 1010, and they want to go to 13. <laughs> and then they come to us and they're like, well, should the president go to 13? You know how painful it is when he's in a different place than the congressional Democrats. And I looked at their research and I said, he can go to 13 if he wants, but don't ask me to say there's going to be no negative employment effects, because if he goes to 13, 
either like you don't want me talking at all to the press or understand that I'm going to say there are benefits. Lots of people will get raises, but some people will lose their job, according to the, the research. <laughs> and that's just because once we get into a big enough real wage increase where we get that sort of deep into the distribution, there really isn't any evidence that you wouldn't see no employment effects. And there is some evidence that you would see employment effects. And so we had to say, well, this is what we would say. And that was respected. Like that was taken as, here's one of our limitations. If the president comes out for a higher minimum wage, the economic team cannot say there'll be no negative employment effects. Maybe one more question. Great. Um, so as part of the Council of Economic Advisors, you probably had to learn about a lot of topics that were sort of outside of your specialty area. Um, so was there anything you learned um, that really surprised you or changed your mind about something? So, so when I was there, one of, as I said, one of the pressing issues at, at the end of the administration, I think, was trying to figure out why wages didn't come up. So every time the job numbers came out and they were usually really good, but wages weren't going up. And why, when unemployment is so low, do we not see wages going up? And so that kind of, there had been research on this idea of market power and how that affects affects workers. And, and I got more into that research and kind of realized, and now you see a number of papers that have come out recently showing that if, uh, if firms have market power when hiring workers, that, that that relates to wages, which kind of makes sense. But I'd always kind of lived in the land of perfect competition in my head, like that was my default thinking. And, and while I was there, I really started thinking, well, I don't know why that's my default, except that that's like the Econ 101 framework that we were taught. And, and we don't really think that's true, that if wages go down by five cents in this firm, I'm going to leave and go to another firm. That doesn't really make sense. And so, so I think that was something that, that I wasn't aware of. I mean, it wasn't new to everyone, but to me it was something that I was thinking about something that I didn't think about in my day-to-day -day academic life, which is kind of what's going on with wages today but trying to bring what economics could say to it. And it, it changed the way I thought about things. So, um, so I, I guess one thing I should say is it was hard. It was really hard at CEA. It was really hard. It was really, <laughs> really, really hard. And actually, so one thing I learned is, um, you know, in some countries they don't have people come in from academia um, for short spells the way we do in the U.S. And there were often people who thought, you know, it's kind of weird because, you know, wouldn't it be better to have like only sort of career, yeah. career people who do this all the time making all these decisions? And I thought it was actually really important that at my most frustrated moments, I would be like, I'm just going to pack up my ball and bat and go home <laughs> because I had a home to go to. And then I would like calm down and I would put my ball and bat down and like I would get back to doing the hard things that were really, really hard to do. And so I, one thing I learned is like there is something to bringing in people who have outside perspectives, who are really knowledgeable about you know, specific areas and then ask them to work really, really hard on stuff that they've never really done before. Because I learned things every day. I was asked questions and told to like, come up with an answer. You know, for you guys who are public policy students. In five minutes. It's like, you know, I get a call from the chief of staff. I need, you know, a memo from you on this thing that you know nothing about in the next like three hours. And I call my staff and be like, okay, everybody here, huddle, who knows about this? nobody who can read about it the fastest <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> and they're like you start writing the memo but i don't know what to write just start writing the memo <laughs> <We'll edit>. <laughs> <laughs> so it was that it was really hard because you were learning uh, a lot of a lot of stuff all the time so it's hard to pinpoint one thing but i think the thing you already said which was god i had to learn a lot of macro yeah um <laughs> i i i learned uh a lot of macro and a lot of corporate tax so I think at the beginning I said, like, Jason was like, I'm going to be the corporate tax guy. Business tax reform kept getting put aside. And then it looked, it, there was a point in the Obama administration where it looked like it was going to pass. 
Jason was on paternity leave and I was the acting CEA chair. And he calls me, he's like, you're gonna do business tax reform. And I'm like, I'm not gonna do business tax reform. And he's like, I'm coming back from a ter- paternity leave. And I was like, you can't do that. You can't do that, that would be awful. And so I, I, yeah, I learned a lot about business tax reform. And um, I think you know, Jason and I ended up writing a piece on business tax reform that we published about a year before the tax bill. And I think what we said was, um, as long as tax reform isn't used as an excuse to transfer lots of money to the top end of the income distribution, (laughs) it's worth doing. (laughs) Good thing they read that. (laughs) 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 On that note, uh, thank you very much for sharing your time with us and your your experiences. Uh, We think we learned a lot. I want to thank them for their, their time and their thoughts. Thank you.